So sorry we're late, everybody. Um, there was a, a slightly contentious discussion in the last session that um, we, uh, it's continuing out in the hallway, so it's, uh, it, it's a sign of a vibrant uh, organization when there's things to debate. So um, let me uh, just start by welcoming uh, people to this uh, memorial session for uh, Robert Jervis. I'm humbled and uh, honored uh, to be able to chair this. Uh, my name is James Davis. I'm a professor at the University of St. Cullen in Switzerland, and I was a student of Bob Jervis's. And I, I would say I'm honored because uh, he was uh, the person who uh, was most instrumental for uh, my career and the way I think about uh, politics and the psychology of decision making. Uh, I'm humbled because uh, I'm joined on this panel by people that I regard also as teachers, even if um, I wasn't in any classes with them, but these are people from whom I've learned a tremendous amount. I think each of them are giants uh, in their own right, and I know Bob uh, thought the same way about each of them and uh, would be, um, or probably is, let's, let's for a moment imagine he's uh, looking at us from somewhere else, um, is very happy um, that we're here together uh, talking about him and his his legacy, and I think as important uh, 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 to, to that is also um, his uh, him as a person. Um, I'm joined uh, by uh, these giants in the field, David Sears, um, who everyone I think in ISPP knows, um, but is a distinguished professor emeritus at UCLA um, and uh, a distinguished scholar of, among other things, racism. Uh, Janice Gross-Stein uh, of the University of Toronto. Uh, she's the founding uh, director of the Monk Center um, and someone who um, has uh, more than once uh, held my feet to the fire, uh, forcing me to rewrite uh, things that I had the uh, audacity to try and uh, publish. Um, and then uh, Jack Levy, uh, who I've known since my days as a graduate student at Columbia University uh, in Bob Jervis's political psychology workshop, which is how I um, got into this field myself. And uh, I should say that Bob is the reason I came to ISPP. I think the first meeting I attended was uh, about 30 years ago in uh, San Francisco, and he asked me to come hand out badges and work the check-in. I was a graduate student, so I was working uh, at the check-in counter, which is how you get to meet all the, the greats, right? You get to hand them their badge and put a, a face to a name and actually say hello. Um, and so I'm, I'm ever grateful for that. Um, we're going to uh, give each person uh, about 10 minutes um, to uh, deliver some thoughts about Bob's legacy and also Bob as a person. And uh, David Sears, who I think probably worked with Bob the longest, um, going back to Bob's uh, time at UCLA, uh, will go first. Uh, then, uh, with your permission, I would turn it over to Janice Stein, um, whose work was so intimately uh, linked with Bob's work. Um, in fact, a number of uh, publications together, um, edited work. And then uh, Jack Levy, uh, and I'll save my remarks for the end. Uh, um, so uh, let's get started, and with that, I'll turn it over uh, to uh, Professor David Sears uh, of UCLA. Thanks very much. Uh, I hope you all can hear me. Good? Okay. Yes, we can. And you're, um, on a, you're on a big screen, so everybody can see you. Okay, good. Well, I'm in the woods of New Hampshire, uh, unlike Jack, who I see has the appropriate background. For, for something of this kind. And, and Janice, it, it looks like daylight where you are. It's eight o'clock in the morning where I am. Um, well, uh, others will have much more to say than I can about Bob's professional accomplishments, which uh, are, I think totally merit the term giant. Uh, my relationship was with him was, relatively speaking, more personal than professional. So I probably won't take my full 10 minutes. Anyway, I'll, I'll read what I have uh, prepared. I first met Bob when he arrived at UCLA in the mid-1970s. 
he had put in his requisite years as an assistant professor at Harvard, which in those days rarely promoted their junior faculty, however brilliant, to tenure. Uh, at UCLA, I was a fairly new full professor in social psychology at about age 40. I had recently also gotten a joint appointment as a tenured full professor in political science as well as in psychology. I was an outlier in the political science department. Uh, at the time, UCLA had almost no faculty in my field of political behavior. For years, the only specialist in public opinion was Dwayne Marvick, a rather crusty pioneer in that field, though perhaps not never as prominent as fellow, his fellow pioneers such as Warren Miller, Sam Eldersfeld, Herb McCloskey, Marty Lipset, or V.O. Key, Jr. In the other fields of the political science department, there was hardly anyone really who had much interest in psychology. My joint appointment in political science had been shepherded through by the then chair of the department, Malcolm Kerr. As at Malcolm's explicit request, I developed, and as kind of the price for getting that joint appointment, I developed courses at both the undergraduate and graduate levels, among the first in America with the now familiar label of political psychology. Um, when, uh, I assume that Malcolm must have been instrumental in Jervis's appointment as well, though I, I have no inside information about that. Parenthetically, Malcolm later became our Dean of Social Sciences, and after that, President of the American University in Beirut. There, as it's well known, <coughs> he was assassinated by Islamic extremists. Uh, he, of course, now, Malcolm Kerr now, is also remembered as the father of one of the most successful coaches in NBA history, uh, Steve Kerr. Uh, the prime movers of the generation of social psychologists who had trained me at Yale and Stanford had focused on highly affective-driven approaches to mass communication, persuasion, and attitude change. Folks like Carl Hovland, Irving Janis, Leon Festinger, Bill McGuire, and Bob Abelson. Several of them had a barely concealed interest in politics, but they had little connection to the discipline of political science or collaboration with political scientists. <coughs> Excuse me. At Yale, where I'd been in graduate school, uh, Yale, where I'd been in graduate school, had perhaps the leading political science department in the country. One of its leaders was Robert E. Lane, who had a strong interest in psychoanalysis and especially in personality and politics. He mentored me in graduate school, and a number of their other student, their students had side interests in psychology, such as Fred Greenstein, Ray Wolfinger, Nelson Paulsby, and Aaron Wildowski, and I, and I got to know them well. Uh, Elsewhere, there was a small coterie of social psychologists who expressed anxiety about nuclear war, uh, and which spurred them to examine foreign relations, as su summarized in Herb Kelman's excellent edited volume, International Behavior, 1965. But there were few connections in that group to the political scientists in the field of IR. When Bob arrived to UCLA, it was a dream come true for me as a result. It was immediately obvious that he had dived deep into the most contemporary theorizing and research in social psychology. At that time, social psychology was rapidly moving into what uh, it became called the cognitive revolution. That next generation of social psychologists chose to focus on cognitive biases in attitude change and person perception rather than the more affective laden consistency theories such as dissonance, balance, or congruity theories. This new wave included people like Ned Jones, Dick Nisbet, Hal Kelly, Shelley Taylor, and Lee Ross. Bob Jervis internalized that new school of social psychological thought and applied it brilliantly to his own analysis of foreign policy decision making, especially in the 1976 book that I'm sure Jack and Janice will talk about at more length uh, next. So when Bob arrived at UCLA, I felt like something of an outlier in both of my departments. I was already teaching political psychology, and I had several brilliant graduate students who followed 
in that uh, trajectory, such as Don Kinder, Rick Lau, and Tom Tyler. But there was little faculty interest in political psychology in any of the fields that ISPP now features, such as, such as social psychology, American politics, or IR, or issues of race, ethnicity, and politics, which were barely on the radar screen in any of our fields. And for reason, uh, I soon got to know Jervis. I had contacts with Howard Freeman, a sociologist newly appointed to run our small version of Michigan's ISR, and he wanted to put out some seed money to build programs at his institute. I got Bob to go along with me in soliciting such funds, and soon we were having monthly reading seminars on political psychology with some of our social psychology students and a handful of political science students. In those seminars, I found Jervis to be the best collaborator I've ever had in such an intellectual endeavor. His mind was like a sponge, soaking up new literature in both psychology and in all fields of political science. He was invariably open-minded, no matter what the field or theoretical approach we, dis we discussed. He was endlessly curious. As someone, as someone myself, who was somewhat insecure about being a bit of an intellectual, intellectual, though not social, outsider in both departments, partly by choice, I found him to be a gift from heaven. Within the political science department, then undergoing some profound changes, especially from a focus on area studies to more general social scientific theories, he was an endlessly active and curious promoter of the most interesting uh, new job candidates. So my first point about Bob is that he was a key figure in promoting political psychology at UCLA, even though he was only there for half a dozen years or so before moving on to Columbia. Though slightly junior to me in age, he aided me in many ways in helping me grow confident about focusing on political psychology as a specialist specialty, even though his particular research specialty in IR was far from my own. My second point is to emphasize his personal qualities, his boundless intellectual curiosity and open-mindedness and eclecticism, and his humility. Self never came first for Bob even though he became an enormously influential intellectual himself. After he left UCLA, he and I maintained a close friendship cemented by annual lunches at APSA. There I would always be clued into the latest gossip about political science, not seamy stuff, but the professional side, who was moving where and, and so on, and his insights into foreign policy. I treasured those lunches with him for his warmth and his openness. At the last of them, not long before the pandemic, his wife kindly stepped aside so that Bob and I could lunch together, just the two of us. That was the last contact I had with him and was shocked to learn of his death since I had no clue about his falling victim to a terminal illness. So that is my third point. What a fine and affectionate and interesting friend he was over the nearly half century of our relationship. Others here will talk about his professional accomplishments, his peerless 1976 book, which set the course of an entire field, his being selected for and writing a post-mortem report on the intelligence community's flaws in the events leading up to the hostage crisis in the late 1970s in Iran. And I dearly remember a later panel at DAPSA that I attended that focused on the nuclear threat posed by Iran. He eloquently applied the idea of deterrence for a general audience. I always felt that if I needed to know something about foreign policy and international relations, even if it had nothing to do with my own work, but just as a consumer of, of the best in political science, Bob was the go-to guy. At my stage of life, I have become all too familiar with the loss of friends and those I have respected so much. Of course, that is the nature of our too short human lives. But I must say that rarely do any feel any losses feel to me such an irreplaceable one as Bob. Thank you very much, uh, David, and uh, thanks for um, an insight into what Bob did at UCLA because I think it helps us to understand some of the later developments and the kind of institution building that he uh -huh. was uh, uh, known for both 
uh, in the uh, universities in which he worked, but also in the various uh, professional societies uh, that he worked uh, in. And I think it's something that we oftentimes forget. Our profession only works if somebody builds the structures that allow it to uh, to flourish. And Bob certainly was active uh, in, in building all sorts of bridges across which uh, lots of people uh, went and met uh, others on the bridge that they might not have otherwise met. Um, one of the people I met uh, on the bridge was Janice Stein, and, and so I'm really uh, thrilled to see you, Janice, and uh, we'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you very, very much, James, and um, what a pleasure, David, to listen to you tell the story of those early years. Um, I can tell you just that one thread, which was Bob's passion for the L.A. Dodgers. <laughs> and we shared that because the city in which I was born was the original feeder team uh, for the Brooklyn Dodgers. And that Montreal. was... Yes, exactly. So that was a constant theme in Bob's life. Didn't matter that he <laughs> moved to New York. Uh, that was a, a loyalty that existed throughout us all. And was a, you know, was the occasion for many, many fun conversations, I can tell you. Um, let me just echo what uh, David said, and I will talk about one piece of his work. Uh, Jim, I'm, I'm going to do this because it exemplifies uh, the fineness of Bob's mind, which was extraordinary, as you just said, David, but also the fineness of his character. Um, and it was those two things together that made Bob such an extraordinary intellectual but also such an extraordinary person uh, and such an extraordinary friend and frankly, you know, irreplaceable. So uh, we would all agree, I think, that Bob was a field maker and when his book Perception and Misperception was published in 1976, he did, as you just said, David, he brought uh, the revolution in cognitive psychology squarely into the field of international politics um, and uh, just attracted and stimulated a conversation among people who had an interest in psychology and international relations, but didn't have, in fact, a home uh, around which to gather and to cluster. Uh, and Bob's work uh, continues, it's, it's really extraordinary, continues to shape the discussions we have today um, on a personal note, I did know that Bob was ill, and so probably spent more time in the last year um, talking to him. And there we were debating yet again whether it was a deterrence model or a spiral model that was shaping Russian behavior in that last year. So something that Bob wrote in 1976 uh, still remained at the forefront of the agenda. But I want to talk today, I, and you alluded to it, um, David, uh, about a little, a lesser known piece of Bob's work, which was a passion of his uh, throughout his life, which was the work that he did on intelligence. Uh, but he did it from the perspective of, of a political psychologist. And the first point I want to make about this is, contrary to the image we have of Bob sitting back in a chair with the latest journal in front of his face or in workshops with graduate students or friends or colleagues, Bob actually got seriously involved. Uh, he was in the world. He was an expert who worked throughout his whole career to improve the quality and the performance of the intelligence community. Now, I think there isn't a person in this room who doesn't understand that working to improve the performance of the CIA, that was not, <laughs> James was smiling, that is not an easy task. It's not an easy task for two different reasons. It's not easy because the CIA is a deeply institutionalized organization with its own culture and habits, so it's a heavy lift. But it was not easy also with his own colleagues. Uh, in the field. So in a sense, Bob was standing, as you put on a very thin bridge, uh, but he did it um, with impeccable integrity and courage and in an unquestioning way that this was going to be a benefit to everybody. 
uh, if a central institution could improve its performance. Now, this was a, a natural for Bob in a way because he was interested in how decisions were made. And given the, the challenges in our field, and I think we all know this, we tend to focus more on failures for a whole variety of reasons. And in the intelligence world, this is a particularly problematic issue. We never learn about the successes. Very rare we get access to the kind of documents and archives that we need to study success. And Bob, um, more than anyone, was aware uh, of how that bias was going to influence the arguments uh, he made. But hey, let me just identify three or four arguments. And Jim, give me a warning here when I go over my 10 minutes, because there's so much in this story that just reveals who Bob is. He's, Bob starts by arguing intelligent failures are ordinary. <laughs> They're not something anomalous uh, or unexpected. And here's a wonderful quote from Bob's work. Intelligence failures are ordinary because it's a game between hiders and seekers. And seekers usually have the easier job. Absolutely wonderful quote, frankly. Um, you know, we could stop right here uh, and spend two or three hours just talking uh, about that. Um, he, then, he then made a second argument uh, that really makes political scientists and social scientists more generally uncomfortable. Um, but it is something I have come to internalize and accept. Bad outcomes are not necessarily the result of flawed processes. <laughs> uh, bad outcomes are a result of the deep uncertainty and complexity that characterizes the environment in which we make our decisions. Now, again, um, we the, the four of us could grapple with that and the deep meaning of that. Uh, but Bob makes his point over and over in his scholarship, reasoning backward from an incorrect analysis to a flawed process is just a pervasive challenge in our field. Um, and the other side of it is correct as well. A good outcome is not necessarily the result of you know, either a good political process, a good institutional process, or for Bob, a good cognitive process. Uh, which makes our work, if you if we deeply accept this argument, and I do, uh, it just makes our work um, so challenging. And, and Bob actually puts on the table without using the concepts that we use today. Um, he puts on the on the table for all of us to struggle with how the pervasive uncertainty, not risk, <laughs> because risk assume some sort of underlying probability distribution. We don't have that uh, in the kinds of problems that Bob was dealing with. And so Bob, that, that humility that you talked about, David, uh, it was a reflection of Bob's understanding of how uncertain the world is um, that we were struggling with. And that's what then, I think, leads Bob to privilege the importance of deeply embedded cognitive beliefs that we all bring to any problem we study. Um, and we're not always self-aware that we have them, but if we didn't have them, uh, we couldn't function at all. On occasion recently, to take a look back at, at, at a very detailed one, at Bob's writing on intelligence uh, about the flawed estimates, and this was, I think, one of Bob's magnificent contributions, frankly. And it's magnificent because it reveals the humility that you talked about, uh, David, in which he unpacked why the estimates around whether or not Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Um, they were clearly wrong, but Bob argued um, over, in, in, and he engaged in what I think um, this is the finest example of debate um, with Josh Rovner, a colleague of all of ours, who disagreed fundamentally with Bob. Bob said the failure was a result of cognitive processes 
That's where his argument comes down in the end. And Josh said, no, it was a result of a highly politicized environment. James is smiling. You, you, you saw these two debate in, in pages of journals, which created incentives for intelligence estimates to skew what they told policymakers. Well, during COVID, um, we were all teaching online and I thought, well, what could I do for my graduate students? <laughs> and so I invited Josh and Bob to relive that debate and come virtually to my graduate seminar. And there was three hours of discussion between the two of them. And it was framed as, well, this is 2020. What have you learned in the subsequent years that would make you change your views uh, about the conclusions that you drew? And uh, in, in, in preparing for the session, I reflected, if we could have this quality of debate and humility in, our, in the political arena, the world would be a far better place. Uh, and why really um, do I say this? And, and, and Josh's performance was outstanding in many of the same ways, but let me talk a little bit about um, the kinds of arguments that Bob made in the room, which James left the graduate students, and you know this, you've had this experience, enthralled, challenged, and dazzled, frankly, by the performance. Um, Bob made clear why he disagreed with the argument that intelligence was politicized, but how did he start his presentation? With a 15 minute summary in favor of Josh's arguments. That's where he started, right? And he made a compelling case for Josh's arguments. Josh frankly couldn't do better uh, than Bob did. It was just stunning. And then to add to the challenge that he faced, he looked at the review panels who argued that it was not, and said they missed important pieces of evidence that in fact intelligence was politicized. So he had gone through all review panels, gathering evidence that said that his judgments and inferences were wrong. <laughs> and he presented that evidence. You know, it's interesting, and it's one that's, and, and let me just share one snippet of this with you. It's actually a remarkable video. We have to go back and find this. Um, but he said he was struck by the fact that U.S. forces that after um, Saddam was overthrown did not search for the weapons of mass destruction. Why didn't they do that? That was an anomaly. And he then says, I can't explain the failure. It just doesn't make sense. But it's not consistent with what he then goes on to argue, but he leaves for all of us to grapple a piece of evidence. He doesn't attempt to dismiss it or deny it or degrade it. He leaves it as a major anomaly that he could not explain. He then goes on um, to explain his own arguments and they're interesting. Um, he said, first of all, he had a very large number of interviews with analysts that he knew. And he said they did not tell him that they experienced any political pressure whatsoever. So he trusted his interview sources. Now, you know, we are all trained on how to do interviews and how we cross check and multi check, but I'm, and we would not necessarily say any of the four of us that trusting our interview sources was the end of the discussion. Um, but Bob said the reason he gave weight to these arguments, whoops, the reason he gave weight to these arguments was because, in fact, he knew these people and he had long relationships with them. And he had confidence that if they had felt pressure, they would have told him. This speaks to Bob's engagement with people. Mm -hmm. He had deep and long relationships as he worked to improve the quality. It's just extraordinary, frankly. 
He then um, went on um, to qualify his own conclusion. He had barely made the arguments in favor of his own case when he then said, yeah, but we have to put some qualifications around the arguments and argue that there was, in fact, a, more, a general political atmosphere in the administration at that time. People knew, in a sense, without decision makers ever saying it, um, that there were expectations. And clearly, he said, that was the background context um, in which the estimates were formed. Where does Bob land at the end? He lands with perception and misperception in 1976 because he said the analysts overlearned from the last era. The last time they looked at Iraq's weapons of mass destruction, they got it wrong. They missed them and they overcorrected for their own errors. And he thought that was a far more, and, and this is a credible argument, it really is. He thought there was a far more compelling explanation than politicization. And then he came to a final one, um, which I think, you know, as we all live in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine and try um, to understand the dynamics and craft the strategies, he makes the following argument. He said, Saddam's belief structure was consistent, coherent, deeply embedded, unchanging, and bizarre. <laughs> and that's why it was so difficult <laughs> to get it right. Um, mm -hmm. Again, I leave all of this uh, with that criteria. Um, in his last year, um, Bob uh, was using uh, many of the same arguments to talk about um, the challenge that he could frankly see coming. Um, but his whole life's work um, was steep in trying to understand deep puzzles in a world which he knew was uncertain in which the answers were never going to be final, in which history was always going to rewrite itself, um, especially if we had critical scholars. And all of that done with this extraordinary generosity. Unlike David or James, I was neither a colleague in the same department or a student of Bob's, as um, James was. But I was a friend who shared an interest in the field. And the generosity of those conversations, um, the willingness to read manuscripts and scribble all over them and say, you've got, well, you didn't think about this, you didn't think about that, or have you thought about that? Um, the openness. Um, he, Bob, was everything we all say about him. He was a field maker. He was a giant. He was an intellectual. He had a deep understanding of the paradoxes. Um, but above all, he was a wonderful, wonderful human being that we were all privileged to know, have in our lives, have as a colleague. He enriched every one of us. And I don't think there's anybody who knows Bob, who does not deeply miss him. You know, he died, um, and it was after his death that the Russian invasion took place. And the number of times I wanted to email Bob, pick up the phone, what do you think? What do you think? Um, you can't count them, right? So we were fortunate to have it. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Janice. And, um, you know, I, you're not the only one who wants to pick up that phone. One of the things that I think uh, those of us in Bob Arts listserv have uh, seen over and over again is uh, WW 
BJT um, on a lot of the uh, postings and, and uh, comments people write. And it took me a couple of uh, iterations before I understood it was what would Bob Jervis think? Um, and, and, and that's become kind of shorthand um, in, in, the, in the listserv that a lot of those of us who are international security uh, are members of, and it's, uh, it's exactly right. Um, I'm really pleased to see uh, Jack Levy, another uh, distinguished colleague, uh, teacher of mine in many ways, and uh, old friend from my days at Columbia University when we would uh, join Bob in the political psychology workshop. Uh, Jack, it's nice to see you. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, James. Uh, uh, I enjoy hearing the comments from David and uh, uh, Janice, the hard acts uh, uh, to follow. Well, we all know that, uh, you know, for the last set, half century, Bob Jervis has been one of the most influential scholars in the IR field, and for many of us, the most uh, influential, certainly in, in political psychology, to his brilliant, uh, original, and, and timeless uh, writings on many of the most important issues of the, in, in the field. I mean, the, the breadth of, of Bob's uh, uh, contributions to the IR, IR field is, uh, is, is really... Uh, uh, stunning, uh, ranging across all levels of analysis, from individual psychology to bureaucratic politics and organizational processes, to domestic politics, to strategic bargaining and international systems uh, dynamics. He was a, a model of a problem-driven uh, researcher, very eclectic, uh, unconstrained by any adherence to any one uh, theoretical approach, uh, always open to, to new ideas, as both D uh, David and, and Janice have uh, em emphasized. Um, Bob's uh, impact was felt on the policy uh, community as well as the scholarly community. I think few did more, I can't think of anyone who did more than Bob to, to bridge the gap between uh, theory and, and policy, uh, especially in the areas of intelligence uh, analysis and, uh, and nuclear weapons. Uh, Bob's intellectual contributions extend beyond um, uh, international relations to other fields of, of political science and to other uh, disciplines from which he drew uh, heavily, um, uh, especially uh, psychology, sociology, history, and, and economics. Um, his 1970 book, the, the, the Logic of Images in, in International Re Relations, offers a theory of signaling, deception, and, and strategic bargaining. And I might add that um, the focus on signaling um, is uh, now one of the leading uh, research programs in, uh, in the international relations field, and everybody goes back to this 1970 uh, book, which drew on the uh, work of Thomas Schelling, the economist, and the sociologist uh, Irving uh, Goffman. It's an interesting combination of rationalism and what we now, 20 years, 30 years later, think of as constructivism, emphasizing both actors' uh, strategic uh, incentives um, and the fact that the signals are infused with meaning and interpreted through different uh, analytic lenses by different actors uh, in different roles with, in different strategic cultures and uh, different historical e experiences. This, this, this theme is um, uh, the, the sort of the, the strategic incentives and the um, um, sort of the different analytic lenses is reflected in Bob's later work on this deterrence theory, the spiral model, and the security dilemma, nuclear uh, revolution, and intelligence um, uh, analysis. Um, so he, he made important contributions actually to, to rationalist uh, theories, uh, as, as I, the ones I just mentioned above, but while simulti simultaneously emphasizing its, uh, its limitations and the need for integration of uh, psychological factors. Uh, the second book that both the David and Janice uh, mentioned, Perception and Misperception, um, drew on a wide range of theoretical and empirical research in social psychology and an unparalleled familiarity with diplomatic history. Um, his interactions with diplomatic historians, he was engaged in a constant di uh, dialogue uh, 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 with them. Um, um, so, and he was always sensitive to the uh, uh, political and strategic context of, in which these psychological dynamics were uh, playing out. And I think David sort of mentioned this as well, that uh, 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 
that the book really marked, and, and Janice, that the book really marked a turning point in the application of psychology to IR and basically initiated a new uh, subfield in, um, in, uh, in within the international relations. Um, perception and misperception is one of a handful of the very most important books in uh, the IR field in the last 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, um, uh, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, it's impossible to list all of Bob's contributions to the study of psychology and IR. Um, as Janice men mentions, uncertainty was certainly, and complexity was certainly um, uh, the central anchor around which many of the other things were uh, were, were built. Um, the roles of heuristics and, and biases, uh, particularly the disproportionate impact of uh, theoretical perceptions and past experiences on the perception of uh, incoming uh, information. Bob also emphasizes the role of um, uh, risk aversion and, and uh, excuse me, loss aversion and risk uh, orientation, as Bob was the, the first in IR to, I believe, to um, incorporate uh, uh, the, the ideas of Kahneman Tversky uh, into uh, IR, though he did so um, not in an un uncritical way. He wrote an interesting piece on uh, uh, representativeness that uh, questioned uh, some of the, that heuristic and it's uh, how it fit into um, uh, IR uh, behavior. Then his work on signaling and reputation, which I mentioned, and, and the uh, <clears throat> crisis stability and uh, the meaning of uh, nuclear weapons. Um, <clears throat> I want to raise a, another theme. The, often neglected in um, uh, many retrospectives on Bob's work, though Janice hinted at uh, some of these. Um, although Bob is um, widely regarded as one of, or the, one of the leading IR theoreticians, um, scholars often fail, I think, to, to give uh, enough attention to his sensitivity to methodological uh, issues, particularly in observational uh, research. Um, <clears throat> with respect to uh, issues of research design and, and case selection, um, Bob was constantly uh, emphasizing the importance of attention to alternative explanation. This came out beautifully in, in Janice's discussion and the questions of what kind of evidence were most useful in, in empirically validating uh, one interpretation over another. Uh, <clears throat> for example, in the introduction to the per perception misperception book, he argued that the, the <clears throat> neglect of structural explanations often led to the over psychologizing, his phrase, uh, behavior that can be better explained by political or you know, strategic uh, variables. Um, Bob uh, often criticized IR scholars, <clears throat> especially. Um, qualitative scholars for their non-systematic selection of cases, Janice talked about this, and tendency to focus on salient events like wars and intelligence failure without equal attention to the wars that didn't happen and to intelligence uh, successes. Um, <clears throat> he also criticized, uh, and this reflects his, uh, his uh, appreciation of uh, uh, diplomatic history. Um, he also uh, criticized case study approaches that assumed that cases were independent and urge attention to the impact of events on subsequent events, on images, perception, and behavior in the next episode, and through what mechanisms they, they had this um, effect. Um, <clears throat> Bob's methodological sensitivities led to a recognition of the, the difficulties of establishing a cause and effect uh, in the world, and consequently to the limitations of our um, uh, knowledge. Um, this is particularly evident in his 1998 book on systems effects, um, where actually Bob thought, uh, has always thought that was his best book. Um, maybe not everybody would agree, but it was brilliant in so many ways and drawing so extensively on work from not only psychology and sociology, from, but from ecology and evolutionary psychology and, and other, other, other places, where Bob argue, argued that causal relationships are often uh, interactive and nonlinear, um, influenced by third party behavior um, and shaped by actors' own views and their own sort of theories, implicit theories of cause and effect. Um, and that environments shape um, actors as well as actors' behavior shaping their environments. Um, <clears throat> this appreciation of complexity led uh, Bob to uh, recognize the limitations of knowledge and to be very cautious in his own uh, 
uh, knowledge claims. This uh, epistemological stance sort of, uh, uh, along with his character, helps explain Bob's openness to new ideas and the quality of humility that uh, helped define his personality and his uh, interaction with others. Uh, let me just conclude by saying that Bob um, made all of us uh, better political scientists, um, and better human beings as well, and his passing leaves a, a big void in the field, though I suspect that his uh, ideas will continue to influence the field uh, for many, many years to come. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Um, my comments uh, will follow, uh, not surprisingly, on much of what's been said. Um, I was, amongst this group, the, the student of, of Bob's, uh, although I, I do want to underscore again that I'm a student of my fellow panelists in many ways. Um, I was going to be joined on this panel today um, by a, more, a younger, but uh, also very uh, distinguished student of Bob Jervis's Karen Yari Milo, um, but uh, owing to uh, the COVID crisis and the need to pick up her son from uh, a summer camp uh, where there's been an outbreak. Uh, she was unable to join us last minute, but does send uh, her very best regards. Um, let me just start by um, emphasizing that I was a student of Bob Jervis's, and I was a student of Bob Jervis's at a time at Columbia University when there were a lot of very prominent IR scholars um, uh, on the faculty. Um, when John Ruggie died recently, uh, Bob Cohane sent an email around um, and uh, said, you know, uh, Ruggy was there at Columbia when one could argue that Columbia had the best IR faculty uh, in in the country, um, and that's when I was there. And uh, I had a choice of uh, working with an amazing group of scholars, but I was drawn to uh, Bob Jervis. And in thinking about that since his death, why why did I go to Bob? I mean, of course he was brilliant, but there were other brilliant people there. Uh, Fritz Kratikl was there at the time. Uh, John Ruggie was there. I mean, these were, you know, Warner Schilling, uh, uh, fascinating uh, figure. Um, lots, of, lots of interesting people. But I think the reason I was drawn to Bob Jervis was not only because he was brilliant and it was so obvious to us students that he was brilliant, but Bob's way of uh, thinking about the world and the kinds of questions he was asking and the scholarship that he was producing um, was, although rooted in social science, um, in, in very important ways normative. And that's what I want to talk about uh, today is the inevitability of a normative take on uh, politics or political science um, that flows from the kinds of questions he was asking and the kinds of subjects he was studying. And I think that's why I was so fascinated by him, because why do you get into IR if not to try and change the world? And our, uh, many of our uh, students today are so fascinated by the ability to manipulate data and come up with some kind of findings, but then stop there um, without going the extra step of what, what does that imply? And I think what Jervis was always doing was asking what the findings implied and uh, how can we use them um, to make things better. So let me just start with the question that Bob starts with in his lecture course on international relations, and is that is, is the condition of international, or does the condition of international anarchy mean that international politics is a realm of compulsion or does it leave room for choice? And I think um, Bob clearly came down on the side of choice. He stressed anarchy um, in ways that many people think were, you know, uh, over the top, too, too much of a focus on, on, on anarchy and, and the realist take. And yet he never thought that uh, uh, the condition of anarchy left no room for choice, or rarely did it leave no room for choice. And at a minimum, um, with the benefit of hindsight, we can ask whether uh, decision makers could have made better choices, uh, even uh, under the constraints the, the, uh, that anarchy provided. And 
and that, that question with which he starts his lecture, I think, you know, is underappreciated by everybody sitting in the class the first day, um, and, and, you know, probably only sort of struck me as, as, as so fundamental to the way he, he, he looked at the world uh, many years later. Uh, Bob was committed to the possibility or the proposition of social science. Um, he, he thought that we could develop theories um, that, div that identified cause um, and effect relationships. And many of the uh, most foundational works in uh, international politics of the last uh, 40 years or so, and I think, you know, Jack just pointed this out, um, come from Bob, and, and they were foundational and seminal. Um, he might not have been the first to articulate them, um, but he's the one who sort of systematized the way we think about them. Uh, central concepts and mechanisms, including the security dilemma, the spiral and deterrence models, mutual assured destruction, all of these are are unavoidable starting points for any serious discussion of international security. And although he didn't kind of discover any of those on that list, um, he was the one um, who really systematized them and uh, taught us um, what their implications were. Nonetheless, um, devoted to this theoretical enterprise, he was aware of the inherent limits of, uh, of, of theorizing. Among the challenges confronting the theorists, um, of course, are the fact that we live in a probabilistic world where many of the relevant events, and you know, you could think about um, important ones for IR theory, shifts in polarity, power transitions, major wars between nuclear powers, are rare or even just hypothetical. Um, and Janice pointed to this, that for many of the questions we're interested in, we don't have the distribution, right? We don't have a normal distribution. Um, and naturally occurring data um, therefore is often scarce, and when it is available, it's suspect. I mean, Bob, uh, this was interesting, Janice, that you pointed to um, the fact that he trusted um, his interlocutors because he was always telling us, don't trust the documents uh, because they're being, if the, if the person writing them is clever, and he, was, he loved to talk about Kissinger in this respect, they're going to mislead you. So the documents, you know, might, might be left there uh, to, to, to draw you astray, late, you being the later, the later scholar. So he was always, you know, he's teaching his students to be very skeptical about what you, what you read, and yet he did tell us to go to the, go to the archives and look at the documents. So, you know, it was a, um, just a warning there. But um, the, the record might, be un, might not be unbiased. It might be biased. Um, and he also, you know, was, was stressing the fact that, that um, all of these developments occur in history. And, and I, I'm glad that Jack pointed this out. You know, he thought uh, sequences mattered, um, and that, that cases were not independent of each other. I mean, these are things that he pointed out to us. Chronologies matter, observations may not be independent, and this, of course, presents important um, challenges both for statistical and case study analysis. And so I, I'm, I was going to make the same point. I'm glad, glad uh, Jack already made it. Uh, to these problems, Jadid, uh, Jervis added the challenges presented by the fact that the international, society, the international system is highly complex, and um, both of uh, uh, the IR scholars here have already mentioned that. Um, taken together, what does this mean? This means that although he's committed to the proposition of social science, although he's committed to the proposition of IR theory, our theories will often be weak, and when they lead to powerful generalizations, the generalizations will nonetheless be vague. Um, um, and that's, I think, you know, um, one of these kinds of paradoxes or, or problems that, that we're faced with. Um, if you, though, think that social science is possible and you think that there's realm for choice uh, in uh, international politics, um, then you will confront behavior that seems inconsistent with what you think are the objective features of the situation or what you think uh, a rational decision maker should do. Um, and in order to try and make sense of these surprises, um, and, and Janet, you said uh, this was sort of how he looked at uh, Saddam Hussein. It was just, you know, a, a wacky way of, of thinking, right? Um, to, to, to understand that, he turned to psychology. And I found this quote from him, which I think gets to what I'm trying to, to, trying to draw your attention to here. Uh, political psychology, he wrote, at least as it deals with international politics, 
tends to be normatively inflected and reformist. And so I think it's that focus on psychology and the psychology of decision-making that allowed him then to, uh, to try and prescribe how can we try to make processes better. We might not get them perfect, but what would a better process look like? Um, how can we make sense of, uh, or how can we compensate for our failures to uh, properly make sense of, of the world? Um, and so I think it's interesting, you know, or it's, it's appropriate to be here at ISPP and talking about um, Bob Jervis, the normative theorist, because I think the normativity, as he says, is grounded in his, in his uh, belief that we need to understand psychology in order to uh, make sense of what are otherwise very odd-seeming outcomes. Uh, sometimes, however, it's the empirical record or lack thereof um, that leads to the require or requires us um, necessitates a shift to normative theory and and here I think um, again the the fact that we live in a in an age in an era when global Armageddon is not only thinkable but possible um, and n equals zero n being the number of cases of wars between nuclear powered states where they use nuclear weapons against each other, right? Um, you know, a full-scale nuclear w war has, thank God, not happened, and yet we don't want to wait for the normal distribution to be able to say anything about nuclear war and what it might look like. And so we're forced or damned to a kind of normative take on, on, on nuclear strategy, on deterrence, um, based on, you know, logical analysis and uh, a logical analysis amended with our understanding of human psychology. And I think that's, um, you know, what he was so committed to because, you know, our continued existence as, as a species uh, uh, depends on it. And uh, Janice collaborated with him uh, on that project over many generations uh, or many decades uh, um, uh, in, in important ways. Um, and so I think the kinds of questions he was interested in, um, as well as the approach, the turn to uh, political psychology forced him um, or allowed him uh, to become normative, to ask whether the, the ways in which people were uh, making choices, the ways in which they were thinking about these important questions were reasonable uh, or whether or we might not be able to do better. And yet, and both Janice and uh, Jack uh, pointed this out, and yet, um, he had a lot of empathy with the actual decision maker. Um, and I think he probably didn't want to change uh, places with them. Um, I, I, you know, he would oftentimes um, point to uh, historical uh, cases that we would, you know, we talk about them in class or even, you know, afterward and, 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 and say, you know, they could have done better, but, you know, they could have done worse too, right? I mean, it's so, um, and so I think uh, there was a, a great, uh, a great deal of empathy. The other um, area where um, this kind of normativity comes out, again, it was raised um, by all three of uh, the previous speakers, uh, was the work on uh, on uh, intelligence um, and trying to to think through the challenges of of getting. Um, getting intelligence assessments right, how how could we do uh, better, but uh, still um, having empathy uh, when when things uh, didn't seem to uh, turn out right. Um, what what he used to tell us in class was, you know, we need to think about uh, strategies that might fail but won't lead to disaster if the assumptions on which we're basing them um, uh, are false. And then also try to build in loops, feedback loops, where we could constantly challenge the assumptions. And, and, and don't start with the question of, of how would you know if you were right, but rather how would you know if you were wrong, if the assumptions on which you're building your theory or making your policy um, are wrong. Despite the emphasis he placed on the implications of anarchy and the security dilemma for our understanding of international politics, Jervis did not believe that the international system is always so compelling as to leave no room for choice or for de deliberation. And I think correctly understood, he's in a long tradition of uh, IR scholarship, largely associated with realism, that, 
that also thought this way. And I think in certain ways, Bob was trying to, or, or at least he did, whether he was trying to or not, I don't know, but he, he reached back into a richer uh, version of realism than uh, I was taught in the 1980s um, when uh, Waltz's structural realism um, was the flavor of the day. Um, and I, I think he, you know, he, he, well, his, I know his favorite uh, IR theorist was Arnold Wolfers, um, and uh, interestingly enough, I teach at the University of St. Gallen, interestingly enough, Arnold Wolfers comes from St. Gallen, so that's a strange, um, and nobody else knows where the hell St. Gallen is, um, strange uh, sort of uh, bit of karma. But uh, Wolfers, uh, you know, also uh, was constantly, you know, trying to, understand the, the when does the, the structure of the situation compel uh, people to behave in similar ways and when is there room for choice? Um, and I'll just give you a quote here from, from Jervis um, that I think gets at this. Statesmen rarely are entirely the prisoner of forces beyond their control, he said. In particular, contemporary American decision makers enjoy a far wider range of choice than their predecessors, even if the blessings of a favorable geography spared many of the latter from the hard choices faced by their contemporaries. Um, there is room for choice. And I think uh, Jervis, you know, really did want us to, to do our best to make um, the best choices. And he was derisive of... Um, structural uh, theories that left no room for choice. Um, I'll just leave with, with a quote again. The temptation to believe that the environment is so extreme as to compel the most awful actions and the statesman's hubris of thinking that their acts are beyond judging are terribly strong and must be constantly resisted. Perhaps as shocking as the calculated violations of moral standards are the many cases in which statesmen do not even think of what their acts will cost in terms of innocent lives, deplorable precedents, and values sullied. And that from a guy who considered himself to be a realist. So thank you. We have um, time for uh, a question or two from the audience. There are a few people here if uh, somebody would like to uh, ask a question to one of our panelists. If not, I, I, I understand Maybe. the I understand the hesitancy of discussing these things with um, the three giants who have joined me on the panel. Um, but uh, perhaps um, Janice, it Maybe. seems you want to say. Maybe so. I could just add that uh, um, just two weeks ago, I reviewed the last manuscript uh, that Bob wrote. Um, and it just speaks to all the points that you just made. Uh, this is a manuscript that asks the question, grapples with the question, um, did President Trump have a long-term impact uh, on institutions and directions of American foreign policy? And he, he wrote the introductory article. Uh, to a collection, uh, a large number of scholars in IR contributed to this. Um, and Bob, uh, he must, uh, looking at the timing, it was clearly in the last year of his life, and um, he surveyed the world, <laughs> as Bob did. And the reason I say this, James, is it speaks to the normativity. Uh, but he did it in, his, in, his, in a very Jervisian way. <laughs> Um, because he looked at all the evidence and then he said, I don't know. I don't know. There are competing arguments on both sides and the evidence is consistent with both. So I want to reserve judgment uh, on this question. I don't know. Which, again, how many of us <laughs> would resist the temptation of making really strong arguments in answer to that question? Uh, but he did, and it's, you know, it's just, frankly, um, extraordinary. And I would only make one other comment, and again, based um, on so many conversations. Um, and this speaks to, to what you said, Jack. Bob was a passionate believer in social science. <laughs> but I, I think, and this is an intuition, and I have no evidence, 
that he was committed to social science because he disciplined thinking, but he was deeply skeptical of how far social science would take us um, on any of the big questions that he really cared about. And so that's why I think, James, you're absolutely right. Just, just as a person who, who went into the field because he was normatively driven, he understood that decisions that uh, leaders make have huge consequences. That last poll captures so much of Bob. And so he needed, he wanted us to all be so careful in our logic, to be so disciplined, to think hard about what the evidence means, not to make the obvious inference mistakes, Jack, that so many of us make when we have biased case selection or the chain of logic um, is weak. Uh, but that was all in the service of the bigger issue, which is, I don't know, um, humility um, and, and it, the, the urgency, the urgency of getting young people engaged um, in scholarship about war and the prevention of war um, and the reduction of failures. But there was always a skepticism. <laughs> and that's why this love of history which was so deep with Bob, um, because ultimately there were, there were no firm answers to most of the dilemmas that we grapple with um, in, in, when we were in this field. And that's what made him, to me, just unique. David, please. Um, i just like to underscore uh, uh, what I think is a big takeaway from what uh, Janice said earlier uh, about what made Bob uh, such a peerless uh, intellectual. And it, uh, this is a, I hope people in the audience heard this and and will take away this message. Um, I, I'm sorry, do, do you hear the yes. chainsaw? Yes. No, 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 don't worry about that. Okay, <laughs> we, we had a a mini hurricane a couple of nights ago and it's still cleaning up the trees here. Uh, Janice told the story of the debate between uh, Bob and another colleague whose name I didn't get, actually Janice, um, Josh. Rolfner, Rolfner. Uh, not somebody I know. Um, in which <coughs> Bob started off by doing 15 minutes of his uh, debating opponent's point of view and the strengths of uh, the arguments that he might make. And to me, that that's one of the things that set Bob aside yeah. from almost everybody else I know uh, working in, the, in social science, that he could do that, that he, he, he could engage in a debate. And it was not that he was a terribly offensive or um, difficult or obstreperous uh, or insulting or hostile person at all. He, he, liked, he liked to clarify alternative points of view and debate them. Uh, but he could do it in a, in a, in a, in a way that was collegial. Uh, but his ability to spend 15 minutes laying out the case for his opponent. I, I hope people heard that. And we'll think about that as a way to proceed in uh, scientific dialogues, because that, to me, captured the essence of Bob's personality. We had yesterday here at ISPP a panel that discussed many of the greats who we've lost in the last uh, few years uh, since the last uh, in-person meeting. and. Um, I think one of the characteristics, in, among them Herb Kelman, for example, one of the characteristics that came out over and over again was precisely um, the humility and the ability of these people to to engage in a, a, a kind of debate or discussion that was uh, somehow not what many of us recognize today. <laughs> um, and it just came through with, with all of the tributes um, uh, that, that uh, these colleagues all had a kind of character 
um, that uh, we really need to bring back uh, to, the, to the academy, but not only the academy, I think Janice pointed this out as well, but to our civil discourse, uh, our civic discourse, which is not very civil um, today. Jack? What do you want to Jack? I think you're muted. Yeah, uh, nothing particular. Just uh, one one thing that strikes me is uh, some of the, the the overlap and themes that, that all four of us have discussed. Uh, you know, I mean, we we there was no uh, you know uh, you know planning of what who was who was going to say what, but the, the number of themes about Bob's both his his per, his character and his sort of uh, epistemological orientation about the limits of knowledge and you know um, i do not know i mean that that, that i li i really like that uh, the, that that comment from uh, from john uh, from janice and it, it just fits bob just 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 perfectly i've sat in enough uh, of his uh, faculty seminars over the years starting with the the uh, political psychology one that uh, uh james uh mentioned, but he was simultaneously, well, for the last, you know, 30 years had run a, an IR seminar once a, once a month or so and attracting uh, mainly Columbia people, but people invited people like me and some from Princeton and uh, Penn who, and uh, elsewhere who, who came in uh, uh, occasionally. And um, um, yeah, we'll, we'll certainly miss him. Well, let me just, um, do we have a question from the audience? Or, yes, I, I I do have two now. So maybe if you can go to the um, microphone, and I'll try to turn this very slowly, or uh, Teresa will, so that the rest of the panelists can see you. Okay. Does this work? Yeah, awesome. that's great. Um, I I came. I was never actually personally a student of Professor Jervis, but I was at Columbia for my undergraduate, and I got to go to you know they have the like, for undergraduate students, they have like pizza and professor little events or whatever that I had with him. Um, and he brought up one point that I've kept with me for 12 years. Are they still there? They can hear me? We can hear you. Um, he said this one point that has stayed with me for 12 years and probably sparked my political psychology interest this whole time. And I actually was wondering if I can get some insight on like, if you could unpack it a little bit, because I think it's great. Um, someone... Asked, they asked a lot of technical questions, and someone asked why Professor Jervis personally became a scholar of the Realist School of Thought. And he's, and I'll never forget, he said, well, two things. He said, one, I was a younger brother. And he was like, so I had an older brother that used to beat me up a lot, and he would always win. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, he said, two, and this came up already, he said, two, I was a Dodgers fan, and they lost a lot. <laughs> and he said, he said, these are things that shape your view of the world that will never really leave you. And I thought that was brilliant because, you know, like we, we do have our own limitations around perception. Um, and I don't know if he meant it to be as groundbreaking as it was for me, but it, it always has been. I, I've told this story probably hundreds of times. <laughs> um, but if anyone could uh, give me more to think about on that, I would love that. I would love that. That's a core memory of mine. I would love it so much. <laughs> Thank you. I, 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 I want to comment on that because I've just spent two weeks here in the woods of New Hampshire with my daughter who has a, a five-year-old boy and a two-and-a-half-year-old boy. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, that just rings so true to me, That's, that uh, the, the dynamic between an older boy and a younger boy. And uh, the, the younger boy has learned a lot about charm. <laughs> <laughs> and the older boy is constantly looking over his shoulder at what his pesky little brother is, is doing. <laughs> so I, that, that just uh, really rings true to me. Anyway. You know, let, let me chime in after David, because that's just vintage Bob, what you just said there. Um, like, you know, Bob, anybody who knew Bob, and, and this is a big part of Bob, but it's unfortunate it doesn't make it into the literature. Bob loved baseball. Ba baseball was both a diversion from what he was doing, but it was a metaphor for what he was doing, too. And the Dodgers were one of the great loves of his life. And uh, why did he love baseball? You know, we could go down a track here, but let me just uh, offer two reasons. Um, one, uh, because 
there were rules. <laughs> it is a rule governed game and it made almost all the dilemmas that we all talk about just a little easier, right? To structure and analyze. And that's why we can all have endless hours of argument. Um, about, and here's the second theme for baseball, that a choice is <laughs> that the managers make uh, these great duels between pitchers and hitters. And Jack, if you don't understand this, I see your face. You're just missing out on one of the great conversations in life. And Bob was into that in a big way. You know, how could they have lost <laughs> given? <laughs> so it was explaining these anomalous outcomes, given the resources, and it was all, James, to go to your point, and that's why what you said, the question so great, it was all about the choices they made. <laughs> and so you can have a heated argument about the choices that the pitcher made, which was gonna be a curveball or a slider, high or low. And if you just think about that, that was all of Bob's work, right? All of Bob's work. And I think that's why Bob truly loved baseball. And you know, I I bought myself a t-shirt. <laughs> I took a picture of it and I sent it to Bob because I was trying to make him laugh in that last year. And on the t-shirt it said, never rest underestimate a woman who loves baseball. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can all see the relevance of that. But, it's so, so often when I talk about baseball with my colleagues, people look at me and they don't understand, right? Like, wait, time, what are you talking about? Why are you interested? Um, Bob totally got why baseball is the most strategic game in the world after chess. And if you're interested in why people choose to do what they do and under what conditions they choose to do what you do, and you can argue that for hours. And in the end, you can't fully explain it anyway. Nothing better than baseball. And, and that, that was a, just a wonderful part of that. Jack? Uh, just a comment on, on Janice's comment. Um, I, oh, I, I, I love that, baseball and, and, and Bob, um, and the, 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 the rules and the, 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 the choices. Uh, but I would say that uh, baseball is more structured than many, than many other sports. And that uh, football or basketball or ice hockey or soccer um, fits the complexity and uncertainty of of, of the world better, better uh, even better than than baseball does. I think that's why Bob liked it because there were rules, Jack. Because he knew about anarchy and he struggled with uncertainty all the time. And there was his cause. James, I think we should have a panel <laughs> on Bob and baseball. <laughs> <laughs> it would be absolutely wonderful for anybody who knew him to unpack as the uh, questioners suggested to us what this tells us about on the, this on, the, on the broader topic of uh, drawing uh, theoretical conclusions or insights from personal experience. Uh, when I was in graduate school, uh, Harvard was trying to recruit him uh, back, uh, uh, as David pointed out uh, in those days, you didn't get tenure at Harvard as a junior faculty, but they tried to get you to come back. And um, they gave him a somebody, I don't know if it was Harvard or Columbia, somebody paid for him to have a little beach vacation to uh, think it over um, where he was going to go. And uh, he uh, went body surfing. And now that picture is hard for me to sort of wrap my mind around. Um, but he went body surfing and ended up like crashing against something and came into class then the week later with some kind of a neck brace and like, and he then wove all of that into his subsequent discussions of prospect theory. Um, and you know, Jack has a better encyclopedic mind than I do, but I think it's in the ISPP or the political psychology article. He actually references it, but it was like, from body surfing, he finally understood prospect theory uh, or a, uh, an injury that he had during body, body surfing. So um, this was uh, not just limited to his brother uh, punching him in the face. Um, uh, Teresa uh, has a question. And then I have a woman. Oh, she's there still. Okay. Um, I have another woman here. 
Hello. Uh, I'm not going to say anything uh, specific to Bob. I have never been his student or I've never met him, but I know him from his studies. Uh, but this is going to be a special thank you for all of you because when I started uh, studying psychology in my university, um, I really wanted to study psychology, but uh, after the end of the first year, I was always attracted to political science, so I knew that my, my field is political psychology, but I was studying psychology in Turkey, so we didn't have very many scholars studying political psychology in Turkey. So I was in psychology department, but I was taking most of my classes from political science IR, so I was trying to make a kind of like <laughs> political psychology on my own. So I was feeling kind of homeless that time. Uh, it was 1997, 98, but I was grown up with your studies, Bob's studies. I was always reading your studies. So very thank you for all of your, your efforts and contributions and making a home for me where I feel no more homeless. Thank you so much. Well, thank you um, on behalf of uh, the other panelists um, because, you know, they might... Well, I, I, I feel the same way about each of them. Um, and I think Janice was absolutely right. Bob created this field. Um, it, it, it wasn't there until, I mean, there was, Laswell was doing some of this and there were people sort of, sort of starting down the, the path, but he really, really made this a field where each of us could feel it at home. Um, so thank you for that, that comment. Uh, Teresa? And to our panelists, um, Teresa has put together a marvelous conference. Um, it's it's a, a shame you're not here, but I know it's difficult these days. It's okay. You you are here. Um, thank you so much for for being here. I don't think I can match your thank you uh, from the previous speaker, but um, I have not had the chance to be a student of Bob's, but I have seen him around. And reading his work, the thing that struck me as, as, as fundamentally different um, is that one, it was considered the home of people in different disciplines that would claim it their own. So Bob was almost like the desired trophy of political psychology, of IR. I've been fortunate working at the University of Birmingham with IR scholars the past six years. And when I talk about Bob, they go like, he is an IR scholar. And I was like, mm, he's in political psychology. And they were like, no, he's the father of IR. And I'm saying, no, he's one of the fathers of political psychology. So there's, there's this like desire uh, an urgency to recognize and claim him as one of ours that gives us, I guess, it's um, a little bit more value. So I wanted to acknowledge that. But another thing that struck me as, as different, like, like Janice, you acknowledged, and, and David, and, and Jack, you said it too, is his inability to grapple with, with, with the, the, the anarchy, like you said, and instead of gravitating towards certainty, which is the instinct of so many of us, um, to give a solution, to give a firm answer, to go with what we know, he was holding on to the uncertainty that, um, that was becoming evident to him. And I think it, this is what pushes him. I have an example from the, um, the political psychology handbook, where he actually did this amazing flip and he did a lot of flips in his work you thought he was taking you one direction and then he flipped you over the other way and and overturned the way that you were starting to think about what his argument was when his argument was neither the beginning nor the end but the fact that you should be thinking about both at the same time and it was this duality this Janus approach looking forward and looking back that um, that amazed me always. The, the example that I'm thinking is contributions of political of of psychology into political science, but also contributions of political science into psychology, which is something that failing to see both sides of the coin. So I just wanted to acknowledge that I, and, and also say that when when I teach my my modules, I start with Bob's. Um, point that there is psychology into politics and there's politics into psychology and only recognizing their co-presence and their interrelationship we do justice to the field coming from different angles so um, 
it 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 has been an amazing an amazing experience for me to be a student reading um, his work. So I I just wanted to acknowledge that it's not a question; it's more of a of a thought. Thank you, though, for being here. Thank you. Uh, let me give our panelists one more uh, opportunity to say uh, some closing remarks, um, and then we'll end on time. Um, I come from a military background, and uh, we uh, value that a great deal. <laughs> so, ladies first, Janice. Uh, thank you, Jimmy. And let me also say, um, first of all, thank you to Teresa, um, who made, who organized a panel in the broader sense, and how wonderful to be with David and Jack and James in this discussion. Um, it's just a, a privilege, uh, you know, to share uh, all of this. Um, my, my last comment really uh, picks up on David's first, because um, we didn't talk about this quite enough. David, you started by saying you were a loner when you start. Um, and why were you a loner? Because you cross disciplines. Um, and so your colleagues in psychology thought you were doing too much in political science and in political science, they thought you were doing too much psychology. Um, I think um, Bob as a pioneer in this field lived that life. It is not easy. It is hard uh, to break out uh, and we forget this, Bob wrote this book in the 1970s. He was um, alone in the field in doing this work. Uh, that is just enormously hard to do. You are pushing against the gatekeepers in your discipline. You're pushing against all the incentives in your discipline. And the, the last two comments, James, um, Teresa, uh, and the other questioner, recreate that world uh, because uh, I was a colleague of Bob's, but it was lonely <laughs> when you're the only person in your department doing this and you're the only person that um, hangs out with psychologists, which is what I did, uh, David, in my uh, early career and spends a lot of time with historians. Multidisciplinary work, genuine multidisciplinary work of the kind that Bob did is very, very difficult intellectually but it's also in a funny way, lonely personally, because you are challenging the structural incentives in your field. But I passionately believe speaking uh, to the people who talk about their student experiences, that the best work comes out of the creative tension and the creative friction from cross-disciplinary work. And so I would encourage um, the graduate students who might watch this to take comfort from the fact that their feeling of aloneness is shared uh, broadly by people who break through disciplinary boundaries. Um, and eventually, the world comes around to thinking the way we do anyway, <laughs> which they have in our view. Thank you, Janice. Jack? Um, I also just uh, want to thank uh, Teresa, uh, who initiated this, uh, James, for chairing, and it really is an honor to be on the, this uh, this particular panel with with David and Janice and, and James. Um, uh, just a you know, just a personal note. Uh, Bob is one of the has had one of the two most uh, Im Im important and influences on my intellectual uh, development. I had, was reading Bob sort of uh, in after the misperceptions book and a few other things. I um, he, that's where I first came across uh, you know prospect theory and heuristics and, and biases. Because of that, I. Uh, uh, on the Social Science uh, uh, Research Council program, I went out to this program at, at Stanford for two years, took courses from, uh, sat in on courses with uh, uh, Tversky and, 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 and James uh, March, um, and that sort of sent me uh, and, and got me more interested in political sci psychology. Um, and then when I moved to Rutgers, uh, Bob, uh, even before I went there, he had sent me an email in inviting me to uh, participate in his, uh, actually two seminars at that, that time, one uh, faculty of seminars, political psychology and the other in, in IR. And 
uh, I think he had to drop the political psychology one when he became what vice chancellor of the university or something something like that. So, the, but the IR continued and uh, being somewhat uh, isolated at, at, at Rutgers, it made just an enormous difference in my uh, happiness in the profession and my intellectual de uh, development to be integrated into the Columbia community like that. And uh, I'll, I'll always, um, um, always appreciate Bob's, uh, things would have been much different without him. Thank you. David. Just a couple of final comments. Uh, one, I underline what Janice just said about Bob being a genuinely interdisciplinary uh, scholar, uh, and that's hard to do. I mean, it's it's hard, it's it's more common for people to be a professional in one discipline and an amateur in the other. Uh, and Bob always struck me as being a professional in in both, and that's a hard thing to accomplish. And it's a hard thing to keep abreast of uh, changes in both fields at the same time. And uh, so I, that's just a cautionary note for people who. Uh, uh, are, are think of themselves as political psychologists, and then secondly, I don't don't want to be misunderstood. I I felt at UCLA to be an outlier uh, intellectually in in both departments, uh, but I never felt lonely, and uh, I was always socially integrated into both uh, collegial departments, and I found people were very friendly and supportive and. I never, even though all my salary was being paid by psychology and I was teaching mostly in political science, I never heard one comment from an administrator uh, saying, well, you should be doing more psychology because we're paying your way. Never, I never got one comment of that kind in over 60 years of teaching. So I think, uh, at least at UCLA, there's a lot of support for cross-disciplinary work and a lot. Uh, uh, and appreciation for it, but th th that doesn't mean there are other people like you <laughs> intellectually, necessarily. And that's what I was trying to emphasize: that that you have to carve your own way. But we all do. We all carve our own way in, in our professions and in our lives. Thanks. Um, let me just uh, underscore um, what the other panelists have said. Thanks to Teresa for allowing us to uh, reminisce and to honor. Uh, someone who was so important to each of us, but also um, to the discipline. Um, I was walking around this lovely city this morning and looking at the the ruins uh, of, uh, you know, Athens past. Um, and then I thought, what's interesting is the, the buildings may collapse, but um, the ideas of the Athenians are still with us. Um, they're with us because uh, people uh, pass them on uh, from teacher to student and because they were written, uh, logos. It's, it's still here. And uh, I thought somehow that was very appropriate um, for uh, my contribution today um, because uh, Bob Jervis uh, may not be here in person um, and even if Columbia University should someday become ruins, um, he has uh, uh, achieved a kind of uh, immortality through his students who are passing on his ideas and, of course, uh, the written work which will uh, live on. Um, and so thank you, Bob, for that. And thanks to all of you. Thanks. Yeah. Good seeing everybody. Bye, yeah. everyone. Bye-bye. Hope to see you again before long.